Let's pray together. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you for this new day. And Lord, that you create all things new. And Father, as we just study your word together now, I'm reminded of those words from the hymn, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, that things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Father, I pray that you would just help us not to be distracted by other things, but your word, Lord, let it plant deep in our hearts that it will multiply about 30, 60, 100 times what's being sown. Father, that we would be hearing your Holy Spirit and walking in your truth and your fresh revelation. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, for some people, life is difficult. Would that be true? Yes? It's difficult when your footy team wins. No, it's difficult when your footy team loses. Yes? No, it's not really. It's difficult when you buy grand final tickets and then your team loses this week in preparation. Not really. No, it's not a prophetic word. It's all right, Peter. Okay. It, it can be difficult in life in so many different areas and different ways. And for each person, it can come in different shapes and sizes. In fact, for some people, they can find themselves like trying to push against a door and the door just won't open. Yeah? Anyone relate to that? And then there's other people who find that as, long, as they get older, bit by bit, life becomes harder. You know, some of the things that used to be easy are now difficult. For example, remembering people's names. Mm. Opening a bottle or a can. Standing up. You know, some of the aches and pains that came once a year are now actually weekly or even daily. And finding where to go. A couple of months ago, I was talking with my uncle and he said to me that his daughter tracks him on her phone. And then she'll ring him and say, Dad, why are you there? And he'll go, oh, I'm heading to such and such. And she'll say, you're going in the opposite direction. She'll then give him directions and tell, to tell him where to go, purely because he's lost all track of where he needs to go and directions. Things that used to be easy have now actually become difficult. Sometimes we face difficulties and challenges in other areas, maybe a loss of job or financial pressures, relationship struggles, maybe even the passing of a loved one. This last week, Jill was uh, next to me on the couch and she had her Facebook and it came up on one of her memories of years ago. And the memory was of her grandmother, who passed away three years ago, aged 99. Now, 18 months after her passing, Jill's dad passed away, and he was only 72. He was a fit, healthy bloke, and then within nine months, he passed away because of cancer. It was during that time that we were facing all our COVID restrictions that were just changing on a constant basis. And when we passed away, Jill was in Tasmania, and I actually flew from here to Melbourne and then to Tasmania. But in flying to Melbourne, I had our three kids with us, and we had to stay in Melbourne for four hours before we got our connecting flight. One hour before we flew to Tasmania, there was these big news announcements going on all the monitors around the airport saying that COVID restrictions had been heightened. So the green pass that I had to enter into Tasmania that meant I didn't have to isolate, by the time I landed in Tasmania, it was no longer green, but it was red. And although I stood in the airport, kept trying, praying that it was going to change each time I tried to scan it another time, for every time it kept coming up red. And I remember looking at the Jill's face and the absolute horror and terror on her face as myself and our three kids were directed past her outside to a bus and then taken off to isolation, where we would be having to wait for, in isolation for two weeks. The funeral was meant to be in two days' time, and I was the one who was meant to officiate. 
I'm going to come back to what happened in a moment, in a little while, all right? So just hold on to that. The reality is that we all face challenges and difficulties and trials in different shapes and forms. And some of those challenges, they're actually self-inflicted based on the decisions that we make. But some come from outside sources. Let me give you a couple of examples. First one, Job in the Old Testament. Okay? He was a bloke who was minding his own business, doing his own thing. Life was okay. And then the devil came before God and said, ah, yeah, well, what about this bloke, Job? And God said, okay, well, you can actually do your best, but on him you can't lay a finger. And so the devil you know, went along and the sheep, the donkeys, the camels and servants of Job, they were all killed or they were taken off you know, um, yeah, elsewhere. His children were all in a house together and the roof collapsed on them, kaputski. They were all dead. But yet Job still held on to his faith in God. And so the devil then had another go at it and, and God said, okay, all right, you can, you can hurt him, but you can't kill him. And so Job was afflicted with these painful sores from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He had his wife who then said to him, why are you still holding on to your integrity? Just curse God and die. And what did he, turn, he said to his wife? He said, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept only good from God and not ill? And scripture then goes on to say, in all of this, Job did not sin in what he said. Now contrast Job against David. He was king of Israel. While all the men were off fighting the war, King David stayed home. And he was obviously bored and he went up on his rooftop and he perved on some other bloke's wife. Oh, no. Got worse. All right? Not only did he do that, he then summoned her to his palace, had sex with... Oh, sorry, had the S word with her. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Then sent her back to her place. A little while later, she sends a message and says, hey, guess what? I'm pregnant. So David, he can't hide this, but he tries. And he organises for her husband to come back from the battle that he would hopefully have the S word with his, you know, his wife. And then it would all be okay. But instead, this guy, he comes back from the battle. Instead of going home, he goes to the city gate. And King David says, hey, why are you at the city gate? You know, you should be with your wife. And the guy goes, no, no, I can't be with my wife when all my men are out there fighting a battle for the king. Such integrity. So David, he then writes a letter that this guy then has to carry, not knowing what's in it, back to the battle. And the letter says, hey, when the battle is really fierce, make sure this guy's there in the thick of it and then suddenly retreat but leave him there. So that way he then died. After all these events happen, Nathan the prophet comes to the king, to David, and he says, hey, David, let me tell you a story. David hears the story and goes, oh, right, let me know who did this. I'm going to get them. And Nathan goes, it's you. You're the one who's done this. He points out to David his sin, and as a result of his sin, he then says, and that child that she's carrying, that child will die. See, Job, he suffered because of an outside source, whereas David suffered because of his own choice. But what do we do when we face difficulties, when our faith is put under pressure? We have in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These three guys who were Jews that were carried off to Babylon in exile. But they distinguished themselves above others that they were appointed by King Nebuchadnezzar to be administrators over areas within Babylon. Now they're serving within these areas and during that time Nebuchadnezzar suddenly he forms, has a dream and then make, creates this gold image, this large gold image. And he says to everyone, when you hear the music play, you've got to bow down and worship the image that I've made out of gold. Well, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they heard this and they were committed followers of God. And they went, hang on, we're not doing this. And despite Nebuchadnezzar saying, hey, whoever doesn't bow down and worship this image of gold, if you don't do it, you're going to be thrown into a fire, a blazing furnace. Well, 
For Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they had the people who told on them and said, hey, these guys aren't doing what you ask, King Nebuchadnezzar. They're not worshipping what the gods that you worship. They're not worshipping that gold image. They're not bowing down to it when the music plays. And the king says to them, is it true that you don't worship my gods or the gold image I've set up? And then he says to them, if you don't do it, you're going to be thrown into this blazing furnace. And then he says, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? It's a beautiful passage of scripture because straight afterwards, you've got Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and their response isn't one of retaliation, isn't one of defensiveness and isn't one of quick, oh, okay, we better do what you've asked. No, they do three simple things. Firstly, they say to the king, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Secondly, they say, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And then thirdly, they say, but even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods nor worship the gold image you have set up. They took a stand despite the pressure that was being put upon them to compromise their faith. They said, no, we will not bow to that. And as a result, they were actually thrown into this blazing fire. And that fire, it was so hot that those who were assigned to throw them in, they got burned and sizzled. Yet they pushed them in and as soon as they pushed them in, Nebuchadnezzar jumped to his feet and he said, didn't we push three in there? But I see four walking around in the flames. And one who looks like the Son of Man or the Son of God. We need to remember that when we are being pushed and in the midst of trials and difficulties, we are not alone. Here's another evidence of it, that Jesus is there with us walking in the midst of it. That was his promise. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Not just sometimes, but always. And so for Nebuchadnezzar, he then says to them, Hey, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, come out of the flames. Come here. Do you know the interesting part in the midst of that is that for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they stayed in the flames and they walked around in it until they were asked to come out. They could have come out earlier, but they chose not to. So when they came out, they were not harmed, there were no singed hairs, there was no smell of fire on them. When their faith was put under pressure, they showed that they fully trusted in God. Let me give you another example. You know, for some people they go, oh, it's all right, they were younger guys. Well, who here is around about 80 years of age? Yeah, a few hands. All right, I see those hands. All right. Same book. Yeah. Who's in denial? All right. No, here we go. Same book of the Bible, the book of Daniel. We've got Daniel who was about nearly 80 years of age. And then we've got a new king, Darius, who's there. And we've got people who are going, we don't like Daniel. The only way we can actually get to him is if it has anything to do with his relationship with his God. And so they devised a plan that no one was allowed to pray to any God except to the king for the next 30 days. But yet Daniel was a guy who would three times a day get on his knees and he would pray. And so as soon as he heard that this had become a law, he went straight to his home, got onto his knees and he prayed as he had done day in, day out. Immediately, those who were jealous of him went to the king and said, hey, king, you implemented this law, but Daniel, one of those who are the exiles, he doesn't obey you. Darius, he loved Daniel and obviously had great respect for him and he did whatever he could to try and save Daniel being thrown into the lion's den. But by the end of the day, Daniel got thrown into the lion's den. But yet the next morning, first light, we read in scripture that the king, he ran to the lion's den and called out to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lion? And Daniel responded, my God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. The trials we go through, it's not discriminated based on age. People of all age go through difficulties and trials. Daniel, he was 80 But when Daniel's faith was put under pressure, he was able to stand firm in God. It's interesting with Daniel, 
The pressure and the trials that he faced, they came from people who were jealous of him. Sometimes the pressures and the trials that we face are because we have people who are jealous of us. People who want to see if we can act, they can actually undermine us. People who want to derail us. And it's being able to have discernment to see where is this actually coming from and what really is their motive behind it. But interesting to note that at no time did Daniel plead for mercy and neither did he seek vengeance on those who actually were against him. Instead, the king dealt with them and their families, throwing them into the lion's den and they didn't even get to the ground before the lions overpowered them and killed them. For Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and for Daniel... They faced trials, but in the midst of their trials, they chose to obey and to follow God. And because they held on to their faith in God, they now stand and serve as a witness for us, but also as an encouragement to us that we too can stand firm in the midst of trials. But what do we do? We might not have our neck on the line, so to speak, but what is our response when our faith gets tested? We read in James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. None of us are exempt from trials. It's been said, trials are the opportunity for us to grow in our relationship with God. Temptation to sin is sent by the devil to cause us to stumble. But the word trials and the word tempted come from the same Greek word. But if we look in James chapter 1, verse 13 through to 15, it refers to the inner moral trials such as temptation to sin. Whereas the tri- verses 2 to 3, it, refers, it has an emphasis on the difficulties that come from outside, from external sources. It could be in our workplace. It could be other people. It could be the devil. You know, it's the external sources that we have faced difficulties because of them. James uses the same Greek word that Jesus used when Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. This good Samaritan who was there just minding his own business, walking along, and it says that he fell among thieves. Same Greek word. It wasn't that the good Samaritan had done anything wrong. It wasn't that he had sinned. It's the fact that he had fell among thieves. The same thing is being said here by James, that we might face trials and difficulties, not because we have done something wrong, Not because we have sinned, but rather it is an opportunity for our maturity, for our growth. The trials that we face are of many kinds. This many kinds, it means various, or a more literal description is of many colours. So the pressures that we face will not necessarily be the same as what another person is going through. For example, if, you know, if, if I have Dan, you know, I look at Dan and Dan's going through you know, some stuff uh, in terms of unemployment with work. Praise God, he's now got a job and that's good. But imagine he's going through that stuff and I walk up to him and go, oh, I understand because I too have been un- unemployed and all that. Do you know what? I may have been un- unemployed, but it doesn't mean that I'm actually in the same situation as him. Okay? Unfortunately, at times, we can fall into a trap where we go, oh, I understand It's not true. We are not the ones walking in their shoes. We are not taking hold of it the same way that they take hold of it. We will be different. And that's what James is pointing out here when he literally he says that it is of various colours, of different colours. That the trials that we face might look similar, but they are not the same. And so instead of going, oh, I understand, it's instead, how do I come alongside of you and just walk with you in this, is the key to it. For some people, their immediate reproach when they're facing trials is either to fight or the flight. (laughs) But James, he actually has a different approach. In verse 2, he uses the words consider and face. The word face, it means that we do not turn our back from it, that we face it front on. If we jumped over to the book of Ephesians, to the armour of God, what have we got? We've got the... Helmet of salvation, the 
breastplate of righteousness, feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel, shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit. Helmet of truth. Yep, belt, belt of truth. Yep, right? What isn't covered? Our back. Why? There's our weakness, our vulnerability. This is what James is saying. Don't turn your back on it. Face it. Because you've got all the armour that has been given to you in order to be able to face and overcome this trial. The other word that he uses is the word consider. Consider means to rule, command or govern. He doesn't use the word consider in a subjective manner of, oh, what am I going to do? It's not like that. It's not one of indecision. But instead, it's this, it's like, if you can imagine, commanding a ship. And you are the one that's intentionally steering where that ship is going to go. That you are taking it into consideration and going, what is the best, best path and marking that out. That you, that our approach is to take charge over our reaction to the trial rather than the trial taking charge over us. Our approach to trials is actually crucial as it will often influence what the outcome is going to be. For example, I enjoy playing golf. Some people can't think of anything worse, but I enjoy playing golf, all right? You hit the ball and do one good shot out of 18 holes and you'll love it and you want to go back again, all right? But when they talk about golf, they talk about having a good approach shot. What they're referring to is you have your green and the flag there with the hole and your approach shot is being able to get the ball onto the green as close as possible to the flag so that you only then have to do one or maybe two putts and it's a low score. The key is having a good approach shot will help you to have the low score. If I do a bad approach shot, chances are I might end up with another approach, you know, or having to do, you know, three or even four putts, which is just atrocious. But anyway, the same's true of trials in terms of our approach, that we're, if we immediately buckle at our knees when we face trials, then we are going to be overwhelmed by them. But if our approach is one where we command or govern, then we're going to position ourselves in order to take the advantage. Our approach to a trial will always affect our mental attitude towards it. James says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. When a person's going through a difficult time, we can usually tell based on their facial reactions or their demeanour. You know, we walk up to them, how are you doing? All right, oh, okay, what's going on at the moment? You know, you, we can see it. Mind you, we are getting a lot better at hiding how we're really doing. You know, and we won't go down that path at the moment, but anyway, all right? But being joyful is not usually our first expression when we're facing trials and difficulties. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm amazing, I'm going through these trials and difficulties. It's so good. It's not usually the response we get. We can have joy when life is great, when things are going as we want or expect or hope. But when we're facing trials and difficulties, often joy is not the thing that radiates out of a person. But according to James, our attitude should be, consider it pure joy. The word pure is actually the word all which means that it's not just when life's great or in some situations, but in all circumstances, our approach is joy. Imagine for those who enjoy doing jigsaw puzzles, all right? Jill loves them. I, I can't stand it. But anyway, all right? she enjoys them, all right? And they, you know, they study a piece and then they, you know, that's where it fits and get another piece and that's where it goes and another piece, all right? But imagine for some people, when they're going through the trial, all they see is that one piece, all they see is just that trial that they're going through. They lose sight of the bigger picture and how all those pieces fit together to actually form a masterpiece. When we're going through the trials, to be able to have joy is actually being able to not focus on the individual piece, but rather see how that individual piece fits the masterpiece. And the word joy means joy because of grace. We have joy because it is God the joy of the Lord strengthens us. It is God who strengthens us. Joy because God is with us. 
joy because what we're facing, do you know what? It might go on for years, but guess what? That is still only temporary in the light of eternity. Joy because of the work God has done through Christ for us. Joy because we're not looking at the trial, but rather to the one who is over and above that trial. When we face trials and difficulties, we can have joy or we can be filled with an attitude of fear, anger, discouragement, despair. We actually choose the attitude. We are the ones that choose that attitude. But the attitude we have, it will actually affect the outcome. James relates all the trials and difficulties we face to the development and longevity of our faith. Pastor Paul said last week, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual beings having a human experience. The trials we face can become a stumbling block for some people, and for others it becomes this root of bitterness and unforgiveness. James indicates that the trials that we face can actually develop within us perseverance that will lead to maturity. It's achieved by if our approach is one where we command, our attitude is one of joy, and the outcome is perseverance leading to maturity. The Greek word for perseverance means endurance and patient waiting for and never giving in. In other words, there's not a quick fix solution. It's not a passive term, but rather an action one. It's not a resignation of, oh, well, I'll just see whatever happens and I'll just allow that to take place. No! It's a strong and a tough resolution in the midst of adverse conditions. And James associates his perseverance with finishing its work. To finish its work, it means to get to the end. That we are the ones who take the initiative to exert the energy and the effort to gain the victory and triumph over the trials and the difficulties. In doing so, we'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. How are we going with facing the trials? It's knowing that by persevering, we'll become stronger and mature and more like Jesus. If we look at the trials as an opportunity where we can grow, then we will face them with joy rather than praying for them to pass. We will see Jesus is with us rather than f- trying to fight it in our own strength. I shared at the beginning of the message that I was taken on a bus to isolation with the three kids. And my last image was seeing Jill in that face of just horror on her face. Had the night at the isolation, got up, I was awake early the next morning and I just opened my Bible to where I was up to in my quiet time and I started reading Acts chapter 23 and Acts chapter 24. It's the story of the Apostle Paul before Felix. And as I read these verses, I felt God just give me this peace But as well as that, I felt him give word that he was going to provide an advocate for us. So that was first thing in the morning. We came to 10.30 that morning and my phone rang. I answered it and it was a guy who was a serving member of the, uh, serving elected member of parliament. His name was Felix. (laughs) And he said to me, I'm aware of your situation and I'm going to do all I can to be able to get you released. You may actually have to do the isolation at Jill's parents' place, but at least you'll be able to be there with the family and I'm also working to be able to get you so you can attend the funeral and be able to officiate it. Leave it with me. Just after 8 o'clock that night, I again get a phone call. Yep, paperwork's all completed. You can arrange transport, you can go. God came through. Why? What was the my first approach was to read scripture. My attitude became one of peace, believing God would send an advocate. And the outcome, we were able to attend the funeral and I could officiate it. Sometimes the trials are a lot longer, but our approach and our attitude are crucial in affecting the outcome joy, perseverance, maturity. Do you know what? I have trials that are going on still. I left Adelaide 12 years ago. I'm trying to get registration with QB. It's still going on. 
Praise God, he's got it. Okay? I just have joy. I have people who go, aren't you angry that they're still dragging up your past? No, I'm not. Why? Joy of the Lord is my strength. Do you know what? I can hold on to those things or I can hold on to what is God promising. Do you know one of the beautiful things I'm loving, I'm do- doing a lot of chats with couples at the moment. I'm enjoying that. One of the things God's been putting on my heart with couples is asking, what are God's promises for you? Do you know whether you're a couple, whether you're an individual, whoever you are, what are God's promises on your life at the moment? And if you go, oh, I haven't got any. Here's something simple for you. Are you ready? Sit quietly before God and say, God, what is your promise on my life? I want to know what is your truth and your promise on my life. Show me in your word. Don't overthink this, but say, just God, show me in your word. Allow the Holy Spirit to prompt you. Book of the Bible. And you go, oh, I feel this. Do you know what? There have been people who have gone, I did this and I got you know, such and such book. I didn't even know that existed in the Bible. Okay, turn to that book of the Bible. God, what chapter? Again, first thing that comes to mind, turn to that chapter. God, what verse? Now, if no verse comes to mind, then read the entire chapter. But as you read it, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me in this? What is your promise? And write down that promise and then start praying that promise of God. For some people, you're in the midst of trials and you are facing difficulties and you're going, I'm suffering this all alone and God wants to speak to you today and say, no, you are not, I am with you and you need to hear my word over this because here's my promise for you. That is my encouragement for each one of us. Now, for some people, they go, I've done that and I can't hear God. Then my encouragement is find someone who you trust who's walking with the Lord and say, I would love it if you would sit with me and pray this with me because I want to know God's promise in my life. Can you do this with me and get someone to sit with you and do it? Why? Because God wants to speak his promises into our life that we would walk in that truth rather than looking at these difficulties and treating them as if they're bigger than God. They're not. How do we overcome the trials? Our approach, firstly, is one of command it, commanding. The attitude is joy. The outcome is perseverance to maturity. It's remembering the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we face trials, we can have joy because that joy, it comes from God. Therefore, during a trial, if our approach is to rule or to stand above it, then we'll do so rather than actually coming under it. Our attitude of joy, knowing that God is with us and the outcome will be that growth and maturity. But think on the opposite way. If our approach is, why me in that victim mentality? Our attitude will become one of bitterness and resentment and the outcome will be immaturity and we'll keep facing that same trial over and over again until we finally learn and grow from it. God doesn't want us as infants. It's time to grow up, isn't it? God doesn't want us as infants. It's time to grow up. Was it that bit? If our approach is why me and a victim mentality, then our attitude will be one of bitterness and resentment and the outcome will be immaturity and we'll keep facing that same trial over and over again until we learn from it. How are we positioning ourselves? To grow and to mature? Or are we still holding on to that immaturity and saying, God, it's not fair? Remember, he's walking with us. He is with us. Our worship team, do you want to come up? Let's sing that song, Goodness of God. I think that's just a real testimony of this, that it is the goodness of God, that no matter what trials we're going through, it's the goodness of God. He's actually there with us in the midst of it. I want to just pray with you and pray for you as, as they come up and prepare. Our Father and our God, you know each person's heart. You know where each one of us are at. And you know the cry of the heart. For some, some of those trials that are being faced are really overwhelming. And they're at a point where they're saying, enough, Lord, please. But Father, we just read this morning, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And we know that in facing those trials that we are not alone, for you are with us. And so, Father, for those who are really being overwhelmed by those trials today, I pray your encouragement to them your promises that say that they're not alone, 
your promises that bring hope, your promises that extend joy in all situations and circumstances. Father, for those who have overcome and are celebrating today, knowing that there have been trials, that there have been significant breakthroughs in, Father, I pray you would give to them opportunities to be able to share these stories with others. Sometimes it's not even realising what others are going through and that as we share our stories of faith, people go, wow, that encourages me because I'm going through something similar. God, that we'll have that courage and boldness to share and testify to the goodness of God, that you, Lord God, are faithful in all that's going on and that to know that there is no difficulty, no trial, that you are not bigger than. I thank you, Father, that we can have joy but also thank you for your promises and thank you for you wanting to grow us that we would go to maturity and be like Jesus, our Saviour and our Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing together the goodness of God.